In this video, we're going to be doing a deep dive on the recently released Next.js analytics, which allows you to track performance metrics for your Next.js application over time and visualize that against when you deployed your application to production. So we're going to show an existing dashboard that already has some metrics set up, talk through what those numbers mean and how they affect the performance of your site. And then I'm also going to show you how to set up analytics on a brand new Next.js project. So let's jump right in. So as I mentioned, Next.js Analytics allows you to track performance of your website over time from data from actual visitors. Now what this means is that you're not looking at synthetic results for something like Google Lighthouse, which might be running on your development device. You're looking at data that comes in from your users, which are probably dispersed throughout the globe. And one of my favorite parts about Next.js Analytics is the amazing design of the dashboard that makes it really easy to see not only the overall health of your site, but also going down on a per page or per file basis to understand which ones are slowing down that experience. Now, Next.js Analytics takes these metrics like first contentful paint, largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift, which are these core web vitals, and uses them to calculate a real experience score. And this allows you to, at a glance, gauge the overall health of your website. So let's jump over to my personal website's analytics, and we can take a look at the dashboard here, and let's dive into what some of these numbers actually mean. So first things first, we see our real experience score here, which as I mentioned is that combined score and it's being measured by 372 data points. And on the right, we're able to track that over time, which we can then track against production deployments and see a change over time. So potentially you release something that negatively affected that experience score, you can retroactively fix that and try to get it back up to 100. Now, if we look down here below, we have different tabs for each of the different core web vitals. And when we change these, we see that the chart over time is updated to reflect those values. And each one has their own rating out of 100. So if the scores are 0 to 49, that's going to be red or poor. 50 to 89 is orange or needs improvement. And 90 to 100 will be green, which is good. So to get the best experience on your site, you want to shoot for a 90 to 100 score. Uh, and hopefully the, the results that you see here allow you to make changes to get in the good range. Let's talk about the four core web vitals shown and explain what each one means. So first contentful paint, this is basically loading speed or when the first content of the page has been displayed. So for example, if you open a link to a social media profile, the amount of time that passes before that first piece of information shows up is that FCP. And we rate that on a score where anything under 2.3 seconds is going to be rated as green. The next one is largest contentful paint. This is the perceived loading speed or when all of the page's content has been displayed. So if I click on a link to buy a pair of sneakers, the amount of time that passes before I see everything and I see my speakers, their price, the add to cart button, everything, that's the LCP. And if this is under 2.5 seconds, then it's going to be a good score. Next, we have cumulative layout shift, which is measuring how much elements move after they've been displayed to the user. So in an ideal world, your page layout is shown and it doesn't shift around or jump around and provide a bad experience for the user. It's, it's really frustrating when you try to click on a button and then it moves because an image loaded uh, so we want to prevent that if possible and keep this number as low as we can. So as long as this is under 0.1, it will be in the good range. Finally, we have first input delay. This measures page responsiveness, so how long users are waiting to see the result of their first interaction with the page. So if I'm on an e-commerce site, I load up this page for sneakers and I click on add to cart, how long it takes for the number of the items in my cart to increment is the FID or first input delay. As long as this is under 100 milliseconds, this will be in the good range. Now, if we scroll back up to the top, you'll see that we have a few different options to change the data that we're viewing. And on my personal account, I'm just on the hobby tier, um, so I don't have the ability to look at information more than the last day. 
For pro plans, this goes up to seven days and then enterprise is 28 days, but I'm just on hobby here, so we'll stick with last day. We can look at the different percentiles. So I might jump up to P90 and see how that affects my scores. And then we can also switch between mobile, tablet, or desktop. Now it's worth mentioning that the real experience score is calculated a little bit differently depending on if it's mobile or desktop. So all the numbers that I previously gave were for mobile. If it's desktop, the FCP and LCP are a little bit different. So the FCP is in the good range when it's less than 900 milliseconds and the LCP when it's less than 1.2 seconds. And I'll include a link to the documentation down below so you can make sure that you have these values. Okay, so I also wanted to show an example of a project that has some recent deployments so we can see how that looks on the graph. So the Next.js website, if we click and we look at some of these, we can see, okay, we updated this blog post, here's the commit, here's who it's by, and that should hopefully help us understand if we introduced a regression that decreased our performance. Plus, we can also scroll down and we have a per page breakdown that shows you your scores either by the page name or by the URL. So we can get really granular here and see if there's a specific page that's bringing down our scores so we know exactly what to fix. I also wanna mention the privacy behind Next.js Analytics. So it's designed in a way so that it doesn't track individual users. So there's no cookies or persistent artifacts that are stored in a visitor's browser. So all of the regulatory limitations like GDPR, et cetera, you don't have to worry about those when using Next.js Analytics. Okay, so let's look at how we actually turn this on for a project. So I just went ahead and found a different project that we don't have analytics set up for. So let's click on the analytics tab. You'll see it loads and it shows this modal that says, hey, here's what it is, here's the price. I'm on the Vercel team account, so we're on the enterprise plan, and there's a fee of $10 per project if we wanna turn this on. So we're gonna say, okay, purchase, let's put that on. And now we see that we've enabled analytics for this project. So to use Next.js Analytics, you need to be on Next.js 10 or later, and after you make that update, you basically just have to redeploy your project and then the analytics will start flowing. There's no extra configuration necessary to get that working. It's worth mentioning that that first data will be available after you redeploy in probably about 30 minutes. So maybe check back in an hour after that deploy to see this data on your dashboard. So after you redeploy your website and you wanna ensure that analytics are working, you can also go out to your site and reload the page and then filter your network requests by vitals. And you'll be able to see some requests in here that are going to the URL. And you see this one is tracking first contentful paint, the value, even the speed, which my device is on, the page, et cetera. And this one looks like time to first bite. So this is how you can verify that those things are properly being set. If you have a content security policy, you might have to allow this URL. Uh, that's in the docs, which I can link down below as well. So that's pretty much a wrap for Next.js Analytics. One more thing that I wanna quickly highlight is even if you're not deploying your application with Vercel, you can still use Next.js Analytics. So I'll include a link down below for instructions on how to do that. If you have any questions or improvements for Next.js Analytics, just leave a comment down below and I'll get back to you. But that's a wrap for this video. Go check it out, try it out, let me know what you think and stay tuned for the next video. Cheers.